to make more money in 2015? <laughs> <sighs> Seriously. You guys sound like you're looking to make an extra 50 bucks. <laughs> Who wants to make more money in 2015? <laughs> Thank you. Who's here for the free booze? <laughs> you are going to be so disappointed. <laughs> because there is no free booze. There is no free ride. This is the fabulous Natasha Douglas, who works at Business of Design. Who's heard of Business of Design? Yeah, Natasha Douglas. You've heard of Business of Design. I know Margaret has. Who else? One, two, three. OK, some of you. That's good. We're starting to make some progress. That's good. Uh, I'm going to just try to stick to the format, because I go off topic sometimes, and it gets a little bit crazy. I start talking about drinking. So I am an interior designer. Uh, that makes me really, really special. Um, no, that doesn't. Uh, I'm an interior design professional. How many of you are interior design professionals? Awesome. How many of you are decorators? Let's hear it for decorators. Woohoo! Oh, that was sad. Let's hear it for interior designers. Woohoo! Woo! Decorators, can you do better? You can. Decorators. Woohoo! Woo How about architects? <laughs> woo! We got a little woo right here at the front. Any other architects? Another architect? How many other ar architects? How many people think architects wait, make more money than decorators and designers? Woohoo! Woo! Architects, do you make more money than interior designers and decorators? No, no, no. <laughs> but they have a mad freaking skill set, and we should be working more closely with them. I tell you that I'm an interior design professional because I want you to know that what I talk about is not theory. I have actual clients today. I'm working with clients today. On Monday, we're doing a presentation for a whole house renovation. Uh, for me, it's not something I learned in a book. I went to the School of Hard Knocks, and I want you to know that every single day, my core business is working with interior designers. I do do a lot of television and media, which is awesome. I've had three of my own shows. I do City Line. I do the Shopping Network. I do HSN in the US and some other guest appearances in the US, and I love that aspect of my life. They do your hair, they do your makeup, it's really nice. But my core business and where I make my money is interior design, working with clients every single day. I'm also editor-in-chief of Dabble Magazine. I was a decorating editor of Style at Home for 18 years and decided I wanted to do my own thing. Dabble Magazine lets us focus on interior decorating and architecture from around the world. Uh, I believe that good design is universal. It doesn't matter if you live in Halifax or London, England, or in Budapest, where the lovely gentleman's company is uh, stationed. And uh, I'm here today because of business of design. Business of Design grew organically out of a need to save me from uh, suicide. I w graduated from design school in 1991, and I was full of uh, piss and vinegar, and I couldn't wait to get out there and make a difference in the world. And it was a terrible recession, and uh, not unlike the recession that we're having now. And uh, nobody was hiring, and I offered my services for free to anybody who would have me, and nobody would have me. I couldn't get a job answering the phone in a design firm. It was really a bloodbath. It was a bad, bad time. So I did the only thing I thought I could do, and I went into business for myself. How hard could it be? <laughs> Good. You're with me so far. It was hard. It was really hard because I suck at business. And I went to design school where the business class consisted of, no word of a lie, this really bitter queen who was awesome and fun and cool, who said on the first day of business class, how many of you are here to make money? And a few timid souls put their hands up because if you're girls, I know there's men in the room too, but if you're well, talking about money is a little, you're not really supposed to. It's like at my generation, anyway, you weren't supposed to talk about money. So a few timid people put their hands up and said, uh, you know, I want to make money. And he said, well, you're in the wrong business. <sighs> There's no money here, and you're going to die bitter and old, used <laughs> up. <sighs> you should go sign up for graphic design, because that's where it's at. <sighs> And then he pulled out this tired-ass book that weighed 175 pounds. It cost me $300. And we began to read through the contracts for the interior design professional. And it was utterly and absolutely useless for preparing me for the real world. I got my ass kicked. I wanted so badly to make my customers happy. Put your hand up if you would do anything to make your customers happy. Keep your hand up if you're willing to work evenings. 
Keep your hand up if you are willing to work weekends. Keep your hand up if you are willing to drop everything because a client needs you. Keep your hand up if you will let your husband sleep with your client if that will make her happy. <laughs> I mean, I was committed. Honey, you can do this. I want you to go to her house. I want you to make this happen. I need this job. Nobody tried harder than me to be loved, be loved, there's no question about it. I'm a people pleaser. Who's a people pleaser? Look around, you are in a profession of people pleasers and that is your ruin. It's your fall. It's why you can never make any money in this business until today, okay? <laughs> until today. Why is it so hard to talk about money? Why? How much money did you make last year? Not enough. How much money did you make last year? Okay, not a number yet. Nobody's willing to give me a number. How much money do you charge by the hour? Oh, okay. I'm not asking to see your boobs, ladies. We're just talking about money. Why is money so hard to talk about? I can tell you how I was raised, and it, it could be part of my generation. I was raised to be a good girl, to get along, to make people happy, to not complain, to do what was asked of me. I'm amazed, I'm stunned and amazed sometimes when I hear stories from designer friends and peers who have young people working for them. And they will say things like, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't really want to do that because it was stressful. I mean, it never occurred to me I could push back in any way, shape, or form to the authority who asked me to do any task. I don't care what the task was. I did it with a smile on my face, and I took whatever money they offered me. And I had some real serious hang-ups about money. When I was 10, I would babysit for this family. I don't like kids, okay? <laughs> do you see a problem here? I don't like kids, but I had nothing to do, and you know, it was something to do. So I'd go over and I'd babysit, and as soon as the parents would leave, I'd be all like, yeah, we're going to bed now. It's only six, shut up, we're going to bed. <laughs> So I would get them in bed as fast as I could, and then at the end of the night, the dad and mom would come home, and the dad would drive me home from the babysitting gig. And you know, a 10-year-old go girl getting a ride home from a dad, I mean, this is just, this, none of this is fun. Not a second of this is what I want to be doing. And then he would say, what do we owe you? And because I was wise beyond my years, I would say, oh, it doesn't matter, I had such a good time with your kids. And then, how much did he pay me? Nothing. What a jerk. Yeah, maybe. On the other hand, I got exactly what I asked for. And my biggest problem is I went out into the working world, that 10-year-old girl who got exactly what I asked for. And what I got from clients was nothing. Nothing. Over and over again, I got nothing. It wasn't the client's fault. It was my fault. I asked for nothing. I got nothing. My very first job, working for myself, uh, it happened like it will happen for a lot of you. Somebody said, her house is awesome. You should hire her. She just graduated from school. She's probably cheap. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You never want to be described as probably cheap. <laughs> if you had to go find a hooker, <laughs> would you want the one who is probably cheap? <laughs> if you had to go find a lawyer, would you want the one who is super duper cheap? No, this is not a good adjective to describe you. But I went to that first customer, just graduated from school, and she said, what do you charge? And I did just what the three of you did, which I know I asked you what you made for the year, and that's more personal. What do you charge? And I went, uh, well, uh, in school, they told us we should ask for $75 an hour. I'm like getting a little nervous now. But, you know, I just graduated from school and I'm really excited to work with you. So, how about 50? Ugh. And then, what do you think she said? You, oh, oh my God, you guys actually are interior designers. She said, 50, that's, that's a little high, right? How many of you are making 75 bucks an hour or less? Put your hand up this high, this high. It feels good, I swear to God, it just feels so good. <laughs> just put your hand up this high. Just show me, show me I'm not alone, okay. Okay, that was 1991, and this is 2015, and I know damn well a good majority of this audience is making 75 bucks an hour. So I was afraid to even ask for 75 bucks an hour. So she said, 50? Uh, 
I mean, that seems a little high. Do you have any experience? And she knew that I had no experience. So I said, okay, 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 you know, <laughs> twist my arm. I'll tell you what. I'll just, I'll just do the hours for free, but everything you buy, I want 10% on. And what did I tell myself? What was the lie I told myself? I'll make it up in commissions. I'm gaining experience. I'm building sweat equity. I'm going to get this published. I'll be famous. This is going to be awesome. So I would show up at this woman's house who shall remain nameless, Karen Taylor, and she said, <laughs> how are you? I figure there's a lot of Karen Taylors. Like, what are the chances they're going to find out who she is? Uh, and, and I would show up at the door, and we had a 3 o'clock meeting, and at 3 o'clock, she'd open the door, and she'd go, come on and sit in the family room. I'm just on the phone, and I'll be there in a minute. And about 3.30, she would show up in the family room, and I had two babies at that time of my own that I did like very much. <laughs> and I had a little baby, a wee baby, and I had, because I started design school like two weeks after I had my first child. And when I graduated from design school, I was pregnant out to here. So I had literally a two-year-old and a baby who I had to hire a babysitter for so I could go to the 3 o'clock meeting. And I sat in the family room and I waited for her to be finished with her important whatever it was. And then she finally came to me at 3.30 and we, we did a little work. And then the next time I showed up, it was kind of the same thing. And then the next time I showed up, uh, she asked me to hold the baby while she, did a, she had to finish something. I don't really like babies. I like my babies. Uh, I don't really like other people's babies. Some people are like, oh, babies are so cute. No, I think puppies are cute. Um, but babies are stinky, and they're all squirrely and wiggly. And um, so I'm holding her baby, and she's, she's doing what she's doing. And then she, and she's saying, she's talking to me like everything is okay. And 20 minutes go by, and 30 minutes go by. And I'm thinking, uh, this is, I hate this. I hate everything about this. But what am I saying to her? Oh my God, he's so cute. Hi, he's so cute. Oh my God, he's so cute. But inside, I'm thinking dark thoughts. <laughs> right? I'm thinking dark thoughts. And I, I, I continually sucked it up and just sucked it up. Because, you, you know, I was raised, you as put a smile on your face. I was raised with good manners. You're polite. You're always pleasant. Uh, and you just put a smile on I never dreamed I could ask for what I needed and get it. So I took it and took it and took it from this woman. And for a long time, for a decade, I hated her. And today, I realize she operated under the rules that I gave her. I told her my value was zero. And she treated me as if my value were zero. She didn't do anything wrong. She's a lovely person, and I've run into her over the years, and she always is lovely to me and always says, you know, I love everything you did. I still love everything you did. I gave her the rules. She followed the rules, and then I was pissed. Anybody been there before? You give them the rules, they follow the rules, and then you're pissed because they should know better, right? So here's how that relationship ended. We finished all the big stuff. Back in those days, I would work the way most of the people in this audience will work, which is the wrong way to work, so pay attention. I would show the client a sofa and a chair and a floor plan, and they go, that's awesome, I love it, let's do it. And then three weeks would go by, and I'd show them the drapes and the carpet, and they go, oh, amazing, I love it, let's do it. And then they'd say, what about the end tables? And I'd say, oh, don't worry, I'm going to bring those next time when I bring the chandelier and I bring the lamps and I bring the sconces or whatever. And then another three weeks would go by, now 12 weeks has go have gone by and we're on our third meeting and I show them and they go, that's great, but um, you, does that going to go with the drapes that you showed me last month? And I go, yeah, of, co of course. I mean, yeah, I'm telling, duh, I'm telling you it's going to go with the drapes you showed me last month. And um, then they would begin to kind of pick at and double, uh, second guess what I was showing them. And then they would start to say things like, okay, but, but when is it actually going to be done? And I'm like, oh, it's a process. You know, it's not an event. And uh, I'm, from, I'm from Los Angeles, so occasionally I just break into, like, L.A. speak. And my mom and dad are from Arkansas, so once in a while I can turn that on, too. So uh, I, have, I have a lot of personalities inside this one head. It's kind of scary working with me, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's scary, all right? Okay, so... 
The relationship ended because we got to the end of the project and we purchased the drapes and the chairs and the sofa. And back in those days, I would just deliver things as they arrived, which is a huge, huge, huge mistake. Rocky mistake. And we finally got to the stage where it was just accessorizing. She needed end tables, a couple lamps, pillows, throws, that kind of stuff. The stuff that's the difference between make it or break it. And she, uh, we went shopping. I, first I did a big presentation and she couldn't decide. You know, she just couldn't decide because I probably showed her 32 things. And now I know that's a rookie mistake, but I didn't know it then. I showed her 32 things, she couldn't decide. I had a great idea, why don't we go shopping? Go shopping together? I'll show you everything, we'll pick it. So we did this on a Friday. I hired the babysitter, I put gas in the car, I picked her up, it's going great so far. What a career I've chosen for myself, huh? <sighs> You're never gonna make any money in this business. I know how that happens. We took her shopping, she made some decisions. It was awesome, I said I'll order everything Monday and then on the weekend something wonderful happened. Her mother-in-law called her and said she decided to downsize and she could have anything she wanted from the whole house. So the client phoned me and said, would you mind coming with me over to my mother-in-law's house? She lives in Forest Hill and she has coffee tables and end tables and lamps and pillows and we can have anything we want. I said, what? Sure, no problem. But my only money was the money I was making on the stuff I was selling. She a jerk because she asked me to do that knowing I'm not making any money? Yeah, I told her. So you think I would learn? No. I did something variation on that theme for quite a while until the dark thoughts got more frequent. <sighs> I know some of you had dark thoughts. On the way out of the house, I'm gonna slash their tires and I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> gonna see it coming, right? Um, so lesson number one, if you wanna make money, you better know what you're worth. You better know the value you add to the project. Yesterday we had our business of, yeah, Wednesday and Thursday we had our third business of design conference. It was awesome. And we ended up talking a fair bit. We do a lot of math at the conference because your numbers and your profitability is really important to us. And our, as a community we gained um, at least $3 million extra uh, of the 50 people who were participated in a gain weight challenge we did. Uh, so we were very much focused on numbers, but we did talk about the value that you bring to the project. And what's critically important to understand is often the client um, sees the value we bring, but we don't see the value we bring. Because we're good at this, because we're good at the creative decorating part, we think there's no value to that. But somebody who's really good at accounting couldn't possibly do what we do. They have no idea how to do what we do. They wouldn't know where to begin, and they see value in what we do. I don't have any idea how to be an accountant. I wouldn't know where to begin. So I see value in someone who can do that. But often we undercut our own values. So the first thing you need to know is you, you do for people work that is complex, uh, stressful. Anybody ever felt stress at work? <laughs> stressful, right? Um, time consuming, uh, all encompassing time consuming sometimes. And at the end of the day, you are creating for people an environment where they can be safe and thrive and celebrate birthdays and holidays and come together in community as a family and live in a nurturing environment. So you're providing this incredibly valuable service, but we shoot ourselves in the foot with a fee. So what I wanna do now is something that, how many of you have never heard me speak before? Okay, a fair number. So it'll be completely uncomfortable. And suck it up, buttercup. It'll be good for you. What I want you to do is stand up. I want you to put everything down. I want you to go meet two new people. Or no, let's do this. Meet three new people, and I want them to. I want you to tell each other what you charge by the hour, your hourly rate. Stand up. Go meet three new people. Tell them your hourly rate. Oh, you know. Stand up. You have to stand up. Come on back. Come on, come on back. How did that feel? How did that feel? Scary. Somebody said scary. How did that feel? Like therapy. Yes. How did that feel? Enlightening, tell me why it was enlightening.
You're seeing what your peers are charging. Yeah? Yeah. How many of you, after having that we interaction, that we finally a moment of actual engagement in the design community? The interior, those of you who went to the gala, you know what the gala's like? Oh my God, how are you? Awesome, how are you? Better than ever. How was your year? Oh my God, it was awesome. <laughs> you know? <laughs> bullshit. I'm calling bullshit. <laughs> this is where your year gets awesome, right here. This is what you need to be talking about. What, who wants to tell me their hourly rate? What is it? 110, I like it. Who wants to tell me another hourly rate? Yeah. 125, do I hear 150? <laughs> 175, who else? Who's 200? Yeah. 225, you go girl. Where do you live? Toronto. Tor Toronto, who lives somewhere else and is charging a good high number? Yes. Waterloo 200, stand up, what's your name? Stand up, turn around. Waterloo's in the house at 200. Who's living in a small town and says, oh, it can't possibly charge what they charge in Toronto? Who's living in a small town? Waterloo, 200. I coach a woman in Red Deer, Alberta. Not even Red Deer, she's a suburb of Red Deer. 225 an hour. She thought she'd lose business. She tripled her business. We doubled her income this year. We're doubling her income next year. I just left her for, we had a coaching session right before this. Your hourly rate is your brand. Your hourly rate is your brand. Don't hire a branding expert. Don't hire a marketing expert. If you're charging 75 bucks an hour, you're Home Depot. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with Home Depot. I actually am a big fan of the Home Depot. But the Home Depot succeeds because of volume, right? If you're 225 an hour, BMW. It's the truth. If, if I'm a client looking for a designer and I meet $75 an hour and $225, $225 an hour, which one do I want to hire? The one I want is $225 if I'm really super cheap. Maybe I'm going to go $75. Really interesting consumer report. Consumer report came out with a study that the number one most hated industry in North America. Do you want to take a stab at it? Yeah. Interior design professionals, contractors and designers. Not car salesmen and not your phone company. Are you kidding me? They hate us more than the frickin' phone company? What have we done to deserve it? I'm telling you, we've earned the reputation. We deserve the reputation we have, but it can change and it has to change. Start acting like a professional. Be a brand that you're proud of. Home Depot makes money because they do a lot of business. If you're a stager and you want to do 100 staging jobs a year, awesome, you're going to make money. If you're a high-end designer, the BMW, you don't have to do as many projects a year. I like to relate everything back to hookers because I think they have a terrific business model, cash up front, no haggling, that kind of thing. <laughs> if you think about a hooker who's charging a very low amount of money, they have to do a lot of business. They're turning them over pretty fast. That's a tired hooker. <laughs> right? I mean, okay, fine, one more, one more. Okay, oh, I love you too. If you're a high-end call girl, you only have to do one gig a week and you're rolling in cash. Right? Be your brand. What's your brand? How many people, now that we've had just this brief interaction that was actually authentic. Real interaction between interior design professionals. Imagine that. Something honest and vulnerable. How many people are going to raise the rate right now? Yeah. What are you going to raise it to? 150, you're an architect for God's sake. Whoa! No, I will hook you up with other architects who have raised their rates to two, three hundred bucks and they are finally earning a living. How many people in the room, a big round of applause if you think architects make more than decorators and designers? Our, our perception is you guys get all the money and we get the scraps, we get the sloppy seconds. 
That's our perception often. And I'm telling you, I know a lot of architects now, it isn't true. Who else is going to give themselves a raise? What is it going to be? $80 an hour? 100? I don't like a round number. 125. 125? Who's 150 now? 150? Let me hear you say it. If you can't say it to me, you're not going to say it to the next customer who calls. How much? Who's 150? 150. Who's 150? Who else? Say it. I like it. I will tell you this. I've been teaching business of design for 10 years. I fly all over North America, and I speak to th I've literally thousands of interior design professionals, architects, designers, decorators, stagers, landscape architects. I have met thousands, not hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, thousands of professionals who have raised their rates and had no averse reaction from the clients. If you're charging 125, you will not lose a single customer by going to 150. I guarantee you. If you do, call me. I will give you the 25 bucks. <laughs> yeah. No word of a lie. I had a knockdown drag out fight with my business coach uh, about my hourly rate. I was 195 for a really long time. And she said, it's time to raise your rate. And I said, you cannot charge more than 200 in the city of Toronto. Apparently, you can in Waterloo, which is awesome. <laughs> Um, but I had a knockdown, drag out fight with her. And after months of arguing about it, she said, raise your rate or we're through. You don't trust me. Fine. I raised my rate to 225. And do you know how many customers phoned to complain? Single call. And that felt so good. I went to 275 a month later for everybody who was new. <laughs> and I'm 325 today and I need to give myself a raise. Yes. There's a few different ways you can raise your rates. One is the, the, that you can send a letter three months from today. Our rates go up as follows. And that was a fun exercise. That was another fight. I wanted to send a letter explaining that, you know, workman's compensation has gone up and my association fees have gone up and insurance has gone up and now I have staff and we have to pay their, uh, they want benefits and blah, blah, blah. And my business coach said, when the phone company raises your bill, do they send you a picture of their grandma and tell you she needs teeth? <laughs> They send you a bill, and your rate goes up. And if you don't want to pay the rate, you can cut your phone off. That's how it is. The second way you can do it, because some of you are terrified to raise your rate. Who's terrified to raise your rate? Thank you. I was terrified, terrified to raise my rate. And I would be lying if I didn't tell you I'm still terrified to raise my rate. But thousands of people are going to hold my hand while I do it, and I will see, once again, that nobody cares. The next person who calls, you give them a higher number, and that's going to feel good. It's going to feel really good. And the next person calls, give them a higher number. And when somebody has strokes out on the phone, you're at your number. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you don't keep on repeating over the phone. Oh, my God. I'm so happy you brought this up. Your rate is not a secret. You cannot keep your rate a secret. Would you buy shoes at a store that had no price tags? No. You walk into the shoe store, oh, I really like these, and they look you up and down. They see you've got a Gucci bag. Yeah, those are 300 <laughs> And then somebody comes in wearing sweats and whatever, it's 100, 100 to them. That's, that's, nobody wants that. If I'm going to hire a lawyer, I need to know what they charge. If I'm going to hire a hooker, I need to know what she charges. You don't wait till you're in the middle of it and say, I I'm going to stop you right there, and we're going to discuss fees. <laughs> Right? Put your hourly rate on your website. Oh, oh, my God, if I do that, people won't call. No, the losers who want free won't call. People who want a BMW will call you. Right? My hourly rate is on my website. My old hourly rates are in book number one, so it says I'm 295. Just for your reference, the, I'm, two, I'm 325 an hour. The seniors are 195 an hour. Intermediates are 145 and juniors are 115. So if you're anywhere near 115 and 145, just know that you know a lot of mid to high end customers are very comfortable with that snack bracket. They don't, they don't, they love when my juniors and intermediates do hours because it's not my hours. They think that's a bargain. Yes. Well, you mean, what do I pay somebody? The industry standards are in the neighborhood of thirty to $40,000 to hire a junior. 
That's an industry standard. But that's not, you don't pay them what, what you bill them out. Yeah. I do do flat fees. It's based entirely on my 15 steps. I do a flat fee in such a way that I get paid for every second I do working on the job. The new thing that's coming to a theater near you, ladies and gentlemen, is the flat fee, which is a race to the bottom. The flat fee, which is, I really want this job. I can do it for 10000 And then somebody else goes, well, I really, really, really want this job. I can do it for 8000 And somebody goes, I really want this job, and I'll do it for seven. And somebody goes, I want this job, and I'm building sweat equity, and I'm going to get it in a magazine. I'm going to be famous, so I'll do it for free. Oof. There goes the neighborhood. So know your value, number one. Number two, charge for every second you work. Every second you work. This is such a sticking point with designers and decorators. And I coach um, you know, quite a few people individually and thousands of people through business of design. And I promise you, if you want to make money in 2015, how many people really want to make more money in 2015? There's only one thing you have to do. If you raise your rate, great. You've already made more money. If you want to increase that exponentially, bill for every second of your time. Bill for every second of your time. If our rule of thumb is, if the client would have to do it without us, we bill for it. So we bill for short sourcing. We bill for drawing. We bill for tracking. We bill for the time it takes to arrange the movers to come and pick something up. And fasten your seatbelts. We build for deficiencies. If a table arrives with a damaged leg, is it my fault? No. I didn't make that table. I didn't wrap that table in Istanbul, where it was made, and put it on a plane, and deliver it to Vancouver, and then put it on a truck, and deliver it to Toronto, and then take it to the store, and then bring it to your house. It arrived with a damaged leg. When I started out in 1991, we had the occasional deficiency. Today, what I tell clients is I guarantee you there will be deficiencies. I guarantee you. Because everything is happening so fast, and it's being made in environments that we don't have any control over. If it's my cabinet guy building your kitchen cabinets, it's going to be perfect, I'm pretty sure. But if I'm ordering a chair from who knows where, there's going to be a problem with it. So. Um, the 15-step process that I use to run my business and run every single project includes two steps devoted to deficiencies. The first one is step 12. It says we do a deficiencies walkthrough. Together with the client, I go through and make sure everything's perfect. Oh, there's a drop of paint there. Noted. There's a snag in the carpet here. Noted. There's a scratch on this table. Noted. We do a deficiency walkthrough, and then step 13 is we resolve those deficiencies on behalf of the clients, but I do bill the client for it. Why? Because if I weren't there, the client would have to get on the phone, call the painter, meet the painter at the house, let them in, have them fix the paint chip, and here's the other thing. Uh, who do you think is more likely to get a satisfactory resolution on a job, me or Mrs. Smith? Me. I give my painter 25 jobs a year. He's extremely invested in my well-being. He wants me happy. He will drop other projects to come and fix the chip on the wall if that will make me happy. The same thing is true at any furniture store in the city. I'm a big customer. I buy a lot of furniture. So when something goes wrong on a project, and I'll tell you something happened about two weeks ago. Of course, it was really good friends I was working for. Did I charge my really good friends? Do hooker charge, hookers charge their friends? Yeah, because they'll get beat up by the pimp if they do it for free. So they have to charge their friends. I don't want to get beat up by my pimp, so I charge my friends. So we did this awesome job. We ordered these two sofas from a store that I love that we use all the time. And for God knows what reason, they lost one of the sofas. They lost it. So we're there at step 11, step 10, doing the installation. Step 11 is the client reveal. The clients are coming home at 5 p.m., and I have one sofa, not two sofas. And the store feels really bad about it. And I said, well, bad isn't going to fix my problem. I'm a really important customer. Right now, go through your store, find me a pair of sofas that are identical or another sofa that looks like the first sofa. Get it to me before 5 p.m. so when the clients walk through the door, there's two sofas. And then I can tell them what happened. And that's what we did. So the clients walked through. They go, oh my god, I love everything. 
And then I said, I'm going to have to point something out to you. Those are actually two different sofas. And they're, it was such a, so close in color. Luckily, it was a gray sofa. And that city of Toronto seems to manufacture gray sofas. <laughs> like, whoa, this is whoa, extraordinarily new. Gray sofa. But they were similar. So I had to show them this is a different sofa. And they're like, oh my god, what happened? I explained. They're like, I can't believe the store lost the sofa. They did. They don't usually, but they did. But because I'm a really good customer, you're not sitting on air, <laughs> right? If that client had done it for herself, she'd be sitting on air, right? A couple of questions are happening back here. What is it? Yeah. I charge my friends exactly the same rate. I have tried every variation on that theme, and when I was younger, I would try to charge my friends less. Invariably, it ended up with resentment and hurt feelings, and I figured out finally, you charge them exactly like every other customer, you treat them exactly like every other customer, you'll make them happy, they will love you, and they will hire you again. And they're, it's very clear that I'm in business mode, this is your project, and in fact, just, this one that I just did, we text each other as girlfriends, and she started texting me business stuff, and I'm like, I'm sorry, we do not allow business texts, that's my personal life, please put those comments in an email and I will respond. And she was like, oh, okay. And then when we got together, she goes, what was that business about the text? And I explained, she goes, I totally get it. The text is for my son and my daughter. If I hear a bing, I know I'm a mom it's a mommy call, or it's a, my husband, right? Or it's my boyfriend. <laughs> um, it's not clients. I don't want to hear bing, bing, bing at 9 p.m. or whatever. Yeah. Do you charge for emails? How, who can answer that question for her? Do I charge for emails? <laughs> Does a hooker charge for small talk? <laughs> yes. How do you charge for emails? Thank you for asking. As a matter of fact, you log your time however you want to do it. I don't care if you write it on a napkin. Uh, we use a program called Design Docs. We log our hours. Sometimes I'm not at the office. I can log on my phone, or I can leave myself a voicemail. I can send myself a text. Whatever it is, I'm disciplined about logging my hours. I log every minute on every project. We bill in increments of uh, 15 minutes. Um, how I bill, how we collect, what happens if you don't pay your bill, all of that is in book number one. Um, I bill for every second. If you want to double your income this year, raise your fee nominally and bill for every minute you work. You'll be terrified. I know you will be because here's what will ha be happening. At the end of January, you look at your bills and you go, oh my God, Mr. Jones' invoice came to $6,000. <gasps> oh my God, he's going to be pissed. He's going to be pissed. I don't want to deal with that. I really don't want to deal with that. So what are you going to do? Because you're smart like me. What are you going to do? SMRT, you're smart like me. What are you going to do? You're going to lower it. Put your hand up if you have ever lowered the amount you were supposed to send to a client. Do not leave me hanging, people. Look around. I am not alone. Uh, these are my people. You are my tribe. We are one. <laughs> In my great wisdom, I would lower the fee. And then I would send it to Mr. Jones. And what do you think happened? Instead of sending him a $6,000 fee, which seemed too high, I sent him a $4,900 fee. What do you think happened when he got that fee? What happens? He complained. The son of a gun complained. And what did I say? I lowered it from 6000 And what does he think? You're lying? Or you're making so damn much money, you ought to lower it. I realized that I was training my clients to beat me up on fees. I trained them. They did exactly what I taught them to do. I feared the interaction, so I tried to prevent it, and my fees got lower and lower and lower. I will never forget the month I decided I was going for it. I was done. Because what began to happen for me is every month when we send out the billable hours, the phone would just start ringing. They would complain about their hours. And then what would I do? Lower and further. Of course. I want to make you happy. You know, $1,000 is not a big deal to me. I just want to make you happy. Right? Who's ever said that? Right. So I lower it. So what did I teach them? Call me, and I'll lower it. You, every month, we'd send out the bill of hours, and I'd just be sick waiting for the phone to ring. And I also got pissed. I already lowered it. Why do I have to lower it more? Oh my God, just lower it, I don't care. I just want him gone. 
Who's ever had that thought? I don't care. I don't care if I do it for free. Just get him out of my life. No. No, 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 no. Bill for every minute. And then be in a position of empowerment and strength to have a conversation about your invoices. And this is what happened for me. We started logging our invoices uh, with real care. And the exact uh, forms I used to log the invoices and the exact wording I use on my invoices, all that stuff I think is in book number one. But here's what you need to know. We logged every task as if the client was looking over our shoulder. You know, sourced uh, fabrics for the family room, living room, and dining room, various suppliers, 2.75 hours. Uh, coordinated deliveries of uh, goods with condominium, concierge, and uh, moving company, 0.50 hours. Every task has to be written in a way that if your client read it, they'd go, I know exactly what they did, and I'm so glad I don't have to do that. That sounds yucky. I don't want that job. And then, at the end of the month, instead of just sending them an invoice for $6,000, I send them now $6,000 invoice and the documentation that shows what I did for $6,000. And the conversation has changed dramatically. Now, if a client says, oh my god, how did we get to $6,000? We have a standard response. If you find any task that is inefficient or ineffective, we will remove it from your bill. Is there anything that you can see in your log sheet that is inefficient or ineffective? Well, no, but it's just so, what? Let me stop you there. Anything, <laughs> inefficient or ineffective? No, it's just getting very expensive. Life is expensive. It's six bucks for a freaking cappuccino at Starbucks. Cry me a river from your multi-million dollar house with your Range Rover in the driveway, right? Like. Life is expensive. It's expensive to live in Canada. It's expensive to employ people, inefficient or ineffective. And we do not negotiate hours. I do not. If you want to fire me because of the bill, you can fire me. I will not negotiate hours. That is what we do. We are not billing for our time. We are billing for our expertise. It is eked out in increments of time. I'm billing you for my expertise. This is how we measure how much expertise we use this month for you. Yeah? How can you share the bill with them if you don't fix When it's a fixed fee, I still log my hours every second. Um, and then I can go back at the end of the project and see and tweak it. But I have a very specific formula for calculating a fixed fee, which takes about six hours to teach. And it works every single time. I get paid when I'm supposed to get paid. And the clients who want a fixed fee really like it. And I can compare the fixed fee projects with the hourly fee projects and know that I'm making the same profit margin and dollars on them. So they work out. It took us a really long time to figure out our fixed fee. Yeah. Yeah. So people always want to know what it's going to cost at the beginning. You cannot tell them what it's going to cost at the beginning because you don't know what they're actually going to hire you to do. So let me run through my process. Discounts and project management. You've got to figure out a way to deal with your trade discounts and what you charge on your trades. Um, this was a problem for many, many years for me. How many of you give your entire discount to the client because you just can't be bothered with the paperwork? Okay, know this. I make as much money from discounts on goods as I do from billable hours. And we bill a lot of hours. So it's your choice. Um, that's one problem. You're losing a lot of money. That's one problem. But here's a much bigger problem. If you're allowing your clients to work directly with a store, somebody give me a name of a store in Toronto. LT. LT. If you allow your clients to work directly with LT, and let's say you were in the situation where I was uh, last week where I had two sofas and they lost one. LT lost one, let's say. Um, let's say it was them, it wasn't them, but let's say it was them. Uh, and you were in the habit of allowing your clients to work with LT. When you phone LT to say, oh my God, where's the freaking sofa? What will they say? Who are you? What sofa? Mrs. Jones at so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and, -so and blah, 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 blah. And the first thing they will do, I guarantee you, is look in the computer and see how much money you spent with them last year. How much money did you spend with them last year? Nothing. You are just one of a million customers. And I'm not saying LT is not nice to their customers. They are. 
but they are a huge company, and they do have to triage and decide who they're going to take care of first, and it ain't going to be you. It's going to be me, because I do not let my customers pay LT directly. I pay LT directly. I do not give my discount to my customers. Now, the perfect scenario would be, and what I'd love to say to you, is you keep the whole discount to yourself. That didn't work for me either. And the reason that didn't work for me is because everybody's got a sister-in-law who's a decorator, a brother-in-law who's a decorator, a cousin, a dentist, a nephew who's a decorator, or they just have a card that says, I'm a decorator. Mm -hmm. And every single store in town, even the trade-only resources, will sell them everything at your discount. There's no question about it get over it, move on. They're just trying to stay in business. Don't hate them. They're just being scrappy and trying to stay alive. So um, keeping the whole discount didn't work because invariably Mrs. Smith that I'm working with says, oh, don't worry, my sister-in-law will just order that sofa for me. And then what goes, what happens? The wrong, the wrong sofa, like, or it's the right sofa, but it has chrome nail heads instead of brass na nail heads. Oh my God, I'm gonna die. Right? And there's all this drama. And I'm, I'm making fun and I'm exaggerating because I'm an entertainer. But the truth is, you don't want your clients to have stress. You do care whether it's chrome or brass nail heads, but you lost control of the project. You let go of control of the project so the client could save 10%. Right? No. I will not do it anymore. So years ago, somebody wonderful who actually shared useful information with me, one of the things I found really frustrating about interior design is that anytime you asked another designer for actual help, what you got back was nothing that was helpful. So I remember a time where I, my painter hurt his back and I needed a painter and I called a couple people that I knew were kind of big designers and I said, I'm desperate, I need a painter. And one of them told me to call College Pro. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, that was helpful. You know, nothing wrong with College Pro, but we all know that you have a painter who isn't College Pro who could help me out. So what happened was when uh, Do Dolly Decorator orders the sofa and something goes wrong, who's the client mad at? Me. And suddenly, I'm having to fight a battle that I'm not making any money for. And I learned a long time ago that money is lubrication, right? I will do things for money that I will not do for no money. Right? I'm happy to deal with the stress around the sofa if I'm getting paid for it. I am not happy dealing with the stress around the sofa if I'm not getting paid for it. That's, I'm sorry, but that's how it is. That's the truth. Anybody else feel that way? Right. I'm not, I don't have to suck it up all the time and just do it. No, I'm a professional. Let me handle ordering the sofa so we don't get ourselves in this mess. So now I say to the clients, it's great. If you have a sister-in-law wants to order the furniture, that you let her do the project and I'll walk away. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, I'm not going to, I can't mix it up. I'm either in charge of the project or I'm not in charge of the project. So I share the discount. 50-50, whatever it is. If it's 20%, they get 10, I keep 10. If it's 30%, I get 15, they get 15. It puts me on the same page with the customer. They love me. They know I'll work hard to get the deepest discount possible because we both make money. And they don't hate that I make money. They love that I share my discounts. Yes? Good question. You're charging by the hour. How can you also take a percentage? That isn't fair. Really? Who's got a phone? Who has a cell phone? Anybody? No, I'm the only person with a phone in the entire room. <laughs> You have a cell phone? Did you have to pay for the phone? Did you have to pay for a, a package so you could make calls? Mm -hmm. Did you have to pay for a package for text? How about data or Wi-Fi? Oh, you can't do that. That isn't right. Oh my God. It's just, if you buy the phone, you should get all of that for free. No, it's a business model. The phone company makes money because they have a layered approach to billing. You make money because you have a layered approach to billing. Be non-apologetic about that. I remember years ago, it wasn't even that many years ago, maybe four or five years ago, the client got one of his bills and he goes, at this rate, you could make 500,000 a year. That's what I said, uh-huh. Well, that's ridiculous. I said, why would that be ridiculous? And he knew I was gonna catch him because what was he gonna say? Because you're a decorator. That's what he was gonna say. I might be a deck, just a decorator, but I absorb an intense amount of stress on your behalf to do all the jobs you don't want to do so that you can go to your job and make big bucks 
and come home to a house that's beautiful that your family can thrive in. I'm just a decorator, but what I do has meaning and value. And if you don't want to pay it, that's fine. Put your fees on your website. You don't want customers who want free. You want customers who want a BMW, I think. Most of us do, right? I do, for sure, I do. I'm going to have to hurry it up. I always talk too long. Limit your suppliers. Find suppliers you love, suppliers that you go to over and over and over again. If I go to LT and something goes wrong, they know me. They like me. They will help me. They will bend over backwards to make my life better. If I go to uh, Weaver's Art, a great store for carpets. Anybody ever bought a carpet at Weaver's Art? Oh, my God. Michael's a dream. I, w I called Michael one time. Uh, we were on at step uh, 10 doing the installation for the clients, and I had borrowed a painting to go over the sofa, and I didn't like the painting. And in my experience, often when I borrow things to place, the clients will buy them. And I didn't want her to buy it because I didn't want to have to take a picture of it. So <laughs> I called the movers. We called the movers, and they weren't nearby. And they couldn't get back to her place in time with a different painting I wanted from a different gallery and swap them. They couldn't. So then I sent somebody from my staff over to the art gallery to pick up the painting I wanted. And she got there, and it wouldn't fit in her car. I'm like, oh, my God. We've, we're down to like a couple hours before the client's going to be home. I'm like, what am I going to do? I need a truck. I need a van. I need a truck. I need. Michael has a van. Michael has a van. I call Michael at Weaver's Art. I said, Michael? I don't need to buy a carpet from you, but I need a favor. What do you need? I need you to send two of your guys over to this art gallery, pick up a painting, come to this address, take another painting away, and return it to the first art gallery. He goes, okay, we're on our way. That's, that's how you get that. So when I need a carpet, who do I call? Michael. Every single time. He doesn't always have what I need, and then I'll go somewhere else. But I know who my number one A team is. Every single time, I am loyal. They know me. They want my business, which means they care about my customers, too. So when there's a problem, they come. They come running, and they come running really fast. Yeah? Okay, um, she's asking about project management fees. I, I don't have time to teach how I do project management fees today. Uh, it's, I think it's in book one, or it's in book two, or it's in both. But I'll, I'll give you a general idea. I, I, I love sharing the discounts. It's very clean. What it did for me is it made my billing completely transparent. I tell clients, if you want on any day, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, to show up at our office and look through your file and see original invoices. Come on by. They're yours. I don't care. I am not protecting anything anymore. I cannot tell you how many, I'm, I'm going to say at least 100 professionals have phoned me through business of design in tears because the client demanded original invoices and they had done something squidgy. How many people have done something squidgy? I used to. You're lying to me. I know you have. <laughs> okay, I, I know you're not telling me the truth. You've done something that you would not want the client to know you did. You might have got an extra 10% the client doesn't know about, or you got a little kickback from somebody that the client doesn't know about. You don't really want them to know. How many of you have done that? Yeah, of course you have. We all do. We all do because we're not charging enough up front. So we're making it on the back end. And here's what will happen to you. I guarantee it. I know no less than 100 people who have been in lawsuits for sure. And here's what happened to me. We were working on a project where we weren't the, we didn't hire the contractor. They fired the first interior designer. It happens a lot. We get called in second. Um, they fired the first interior designer and they were already in the middle of construction. Everything is going great. The clients were happy. We were happy. We were in the middle of a love fest. Life was good. We'd done a lot of our work and we were nearing the, you know, finish line. I got a letter from a lawyer demanding 100% of my original invoices. This was a massive McMansion in Woodbridge, three floors, uh, I don't know, 12,000 square feet, insanity. All of my invoices, and we did everything. We did decorative finishes and all the furniture and all the architectural treatments and window car. Oh, my God. So I feel sick. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? And my next thought, my very next thought is, thank you, God. I have a process and a system that I follow without fail every single time. And how I bill that client is in writing, and I am 100% sure I did exactly what I said I was going to do. 
okay. Because five years before that, I think I would have had to be hospitalized thinking about <laughs> what I was going to have to do to get myself out of the mess, right? So I phoned the client and I said, oh, you mind telling me what's going on? I don't know what's going on. So here's what happened. The contractor had a deal with the client in writing that he was going to charge a 10% markup on everything he did. And one of the trades, one of the contractor's trades got pissed off at him. So he went to the client and he said, I want you to know that contractor marked me up 100%, just so you know. All right? It was a five-year lawsuit. The contractor went out of business, probably opened up under another name and did it to the next guy. And I called the client, and this, that's the story he told me. And I said, well, you know, Paul, it's going to take us 10 hours to do that work for you, and I'm going to have to bill you for it. And then what proceeded from his mouth was non-repeatable. I mean, he just <laughs> lost it. And I'm holding the phone out to the office, and everybody's like, <sighs> so I'm like, okay, 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 okay. settle down, settle down, settle down. I have, a, I have an idea. You can ask for 10 receipts, anything you want, any room in the house, could be labor and service, it could be a sofa which has fabric and the guy who made it and the trim and the fabric shield spray on top. Any 10 things in your whole house. And here's the important part. I will get them to you today. You'll have them in your hands today. I will put them in a cab, it'll take me about an hour. Put them in a cab and you will have them today. <coughs> and that's how I got myself out of the lawsuit. And before that, I did what every single one of you probably does, 99% of you. What you do is you mark it up with whatever you think you can get away with. That's the truth. So when a client asks you what's your markup, what you ought to say is, I mark it up with whatever I think I can get away with. <laughs> that is the truth. You want to be authentic? You want to be honest? Let's be honest with each other. How many mark it up with whatever you think you can get away with? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Not me. Oh, no, not me. Oh. Of course you do. So... I have a very um, specific formula I use for marking down my trades, not marking up. I mark my trades down, and I share the difference. And I, it's really, it's a day seminar. Yeah. In your contract. Awesome. You're awesome. Okay. Um, step. <laughs> Good, that's a big step. Your contract is critically important to you. Style and accessories add up. I cannot tell you how much they add up. So years ago, I told you, I used to like show them the sofa and then show them their drapes, and it took like months to get, you know, get my act together. Today, it's very different. The first page of my contract is my 15-step process. My contract is in book two, by the way, and I do my styling and accessories very different. I only borrow accessories for styling. I do a presentation which includes all the big things they're going to buy, drapes, sofas, chairs, lamps, tables, footstools, uh, chandeliers, the paint, uh, crown molding, all that kind of stuff. That's all I do, a presentation at step five. 100% of their house is done. The only thing missing at step five is accessories. And the accessories, uh, the way that we do it at step 10 is I borrow accessories from the stores who know me, and the movers go around and pick all that stuff up. So on installation day, they deliver it to the house, we place everything, and the client then has 48 hours to decide if they take it or they don't take it. And I cannot tell you how much that changed my bottom line. This is the stage at which every project that I did finished when I started. And I know for sure, you don't have to put your hand up, this is the stage that the majority of your projects finish at. Give me a little nod if I'm on the right tack. I know, because I did it. The client runs out of patience, they run out of time, they run out of money, and they're done. And then you get Canadian fired. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Kimberly, you have done such a great job. We love everything. We do. We love you. But I'm just going to finish it myself now. I'm just going to go over to HomeSense, pick up a couple of goodies. And we said, oh, but no, it's, it's not finished. I mean, I know the chair and the stuff and the drapes and the car. It's beautiful, but it's not finished. I mean, I need to put art. No, 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 Kimberly, you have done so much for us. It's okay. We'll just do it. Anybody ever been Canadian fired? <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> Canadian fired. That was the story of my life before the 15 steps. 
Canadian fired is how I rolled every day. Canadian fired. Canadian fired. Another project ends in Canadian fired. And I'm having dark thoughts. So I spent 10 years working with a business coach who knows nothing about interior design and said, you got to help me. I'm going to kill myself. I want a business I can feel proud of. I want a business that values what I do. I want to do great work. I want to do beautifully creative work for people. She had no idea how to help me. But in a 10-year process, we began to develop systems that helped me figure out how to make really great money, really good money, and make really good money, right? And that really mattered to me. That was important to me. I'm a, I grew up with no money. I came from family with no money. And to me, money meant freedom and choice. And, and my mom and my dad, my, my dad told me, my dad forced me to take typing because I'd never amount to anything. That's what my dad told me. Yeah. So I was very driven to amount to something. So I'm not saying it's healthy, but I'm sort of driven. And money is a measure of our success. That's the truth. You're going to get tired at some point of telling yourself that you're awesome, but you made $12,000 this year. <laughs> you are, right? So this is one of the things that was transformative. And I didn't know it would work when we did it. But what we did is we started borrowing the accessories. And we just placed them in the room. And we tell the client, you don't have to buy anything. Don't worry about it. I'll return it if you don't like. Not a problem. And what shocked the hell out of me is they buy everything, <laughs> everything. And I'm not fleecing them. I am not fleecing them. I have sold people things they do not need. I have. I admit it. But I have never sold anybody something they do not want. She wanted everything in that room. This project's about eight years old. She's become a very dear friend. The room looks exactly the same eight years later, and she loves it. She loves it. I'm really proud of that room. I think it's beautiful. Eight years later, she has not had to redecorate three times. I can't see that being tired for another 10 years, right? So she's hired us to do her next house and then her next house because I didn't get Canadian fired for a change. And, right? I mean, what happens when you get Canadian fired? What do you lose? You lose your trademark. And what I was missing 10 years ago, I did not have a single repeat customer. I did not have a single referral customer. Why do I not, why do I not have a referral customer? <laughs> I can do that myself. I can't believe that took nine months. Do you know what I mean? From that to that is how you're going to make the money you need to make. And you got to have processes and systems. you got to be like a Starbucks and a McDonald's. you got to run every project through the machine that is you, and every project works the same way. Yes? Yeah, the forever first person I would hire is not the person you think I would hire. A lot of you want to hire someone, you want an assistant because you want them to take care of all the chaos so you can just think. And um, it won't work. They, they, you'll end in tears. You'll shoot yourself in the foot. They will bully you. They will beat you up. You're, you'll have people work for you who say, I've scheduled an appointment for us on Tuesday because we need to talk. Right? And you're the boss. And you're like, hell no. What's happened to my life? I could not keep staff. I had a constant turnover of staff every year. Quit, 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 quit. When I began to introduce the 15 steps, every single one of them stuck around. Uh, right? I now have somebody who's worked for me for 12 years, somebody for 9 years, somebody for 8 years, somebody for 7 years. I mean, do you know what that means? That means I can go to LA for 3 weeks and see my daughter and I don't even have to think about work. And all my projects will run perfectly, smoothly, without me. I am replaceable. I am dispensable. But I still make money. <laughs> it's awesome. The very first person I would hire is not the person you think it is. The very first person I would hire is someone to answer your phone. You suck at answering the phone. 
Somebody phoned you, I'm thinking about a decorating project, and you call them back in between one client and another client. You're like, oh, hi, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, oh, God, yeah, we'd love to work with you. Uh, can I have a cappuccino, please? Uh-huh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, we do projects in Forest Hill all the time. Like, no, no, cappuccino, not latte. Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, oh, God, yeah, oh, I love Tudor. You have a Tudor house? Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. No, for fuck's sake, I said cappuccino. <laughs> Um, uh, can we, oh, sorry, I said the effort, Natasha, I'm so sorry. So Natasha says mother and father, mother and father. I'm, I'm trying, I'm really trying, mother and father, mother and father. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, oh yeah, oh, you have a, your front door, sorry, it's purple. Yeah, do it. Yeah, I think red would be great. Yeah, I love red. Red for a French door is great. Yeah. Well, blue, yeah, blue is nice too. Like, how, how much? Okay, here. Blue is nice. Yeah, blue is awesome. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, we sure we do landscaping too. Um, interlocking? Yeah, for sure, for sure. 45 minutes later, they've sucked your brain dry, you're pissed off, and you have gotten nothing out of it. And guess what? They're not going to hire you because you sound like a freaking idiot. <laughs> right? Conversely, somebody else answers your phone. I don't care if um, he's a bald man in uh, Alberta who's sitting in his underwear. He's awesome at sales. Awesome at sales. That's all he does is sales. So immediately when somebody phones you about a, co a consultation, and every project begins with a consultation, every project without fail. In fact, how do I know that? I know that because step one says consultation. Consultation is the first step. Every project begins with a consultation. So the person who's answering your phone has one and only one job, sell a consultation. You're trying to sell a project while you're standing in line at Starbucks late for your next appointment. You're not going to get it. She's going to sell or he's going to sell one consultation. One consultation is pretty easy to sell. It's easy. Here's what is going to happen at the consultation. You're going to get the following things done. Oh my god, that sounds awesome. Where do I sign up? Very easy to sell a consultation if it's not you. You suck at selling consultations. Because you know, they'll say, how much is a consultation? You'll go, well, <laughs> we can talk about that when we're together. No, you cannot talk about that when you're together. You have to tell them up front. Because every consultation must absolutely, without fail, be a paid consultation. Why? Because that's what professional escort providers do. If you're a professional escort provider, you do not offer first-time free incentives. <laughs> you would be a very tired professional escort. Would you not? You agree. I'm looking for a regular girl. Can I just try in a night? Can you imagine? You would be worn out, tired, bitter, angry, resentful, right? They do not offer deals to repeat customers or, or people who seem really nice. They don't work for free, even if business is slow. They do not work for free. How many of you have taken a job for free? I know you have. And this is the, really the most important thing. They don't chase people for money. Why? Money on the table, and then we talk. So when somebody phones your office for a consultation, the person who answers the phone will get a visa and they will collect the money for your consultation and it will be in your bank account before you show up at their house. And that means when you show up at your house, they already have a professional impression of you. You're ready to work. You're going to work your butt off at that consultation. You are going to impress them with all of your great ideas and you will not feel resentful if you don't get a job because you've been paid. And if you go to the consultation for free, what happens? I know what happens when you're young. You try to impress them with all your good ideas. But you were free. So what does the client think your value is or your brand is? Pretty low. So they might have three or four people in for free. And then the problem is your ideas aren't the same. So which one's really the expert? I guarantee you if you charge 500 bucks for two hours for a consultation, they will pay attention and you will get a job. I guarantee if you go for free, they will wear you out for nothing. Yeah. Number one person I would hire is somebody to answer your phone. Find somebody, you can pay 25 bucks an hour, you'll probably invest 100 bucks a month, your phone doesn't ring that often. They will sell your consultations, they will collect the visa, and you will automatically, I guarantee you, get more sales. Because here's what happens when I soon answers my phone. She says, oh, great to hear from you. Uh, you must have heard of us from one of our happy customers. Who was it so I can thank them? What has she just told them? I have happy customers. 
all my customers could hate me. But she's just told them that I have happy customers. Have you, do you do that when you answer your phone? I would feel ridiculous saying that. I would feel ridiculous. And then they say, oh, okay, well, I bought a tutor, and we're thinking of painting the front door. And she says, oh, whoa, 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 I'm going to stop you there. I'm not a decorator. I'm not a designer. I don't have an idea what color you should paint your front door. I like polka dots, but I wouldn't do that. I would have Kimberly to your house for two hours for $800, and she's going to solve that problem for you and 100 other problems as well. Done. Give me the visa. Sign them up. And then sometimes they'll say, oh, I just, but I just want to meet her. You can meet her. She'd love to meet you. It's $800. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. The, this, is, this is what I struggle with for the first five years I work with a business coach. I thought every job was unique. No. Every job is a cappuccino from Starbucks. Every job. It has to be run the exact same way, whether it's one bedroom or you're building a huge house. Every job is the same. So you have to systematically organize it so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you step out of the office. We have one flat fee for consultation for two hours that's $800. Some people will say, $800, who does she think she is? And then I soon will say, you know, uh, I get it that that's a lot of money and I can appreciate that. But our customers uh, love Kimberly and we have an 85% repeat and referral rate. Oh, that's, that's pretty good. Where if I guarantee you, if I'm answering the phone and they say, $800, who do you think you are? I'd be all like, well, okay, well, it's been a little slow. <laughs> so uh, why don't we just say five? Five is such a nice number, <laughs> right? You know you've done it. You've done it, right? So get someone to answer your phone. Even if you're a small one of proprietor, find somebody who's good at sales. Pay them 25 30 bucks an hour. You will earn that money back 100 times. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. And every single consultation is two hours, $800. There are no exceptions. I don't care what it is. Monday to Friday, 9 to 5.30, at, they want to meet you at 8 p.m. That's terrific. We're not open at 8 p.m., but that's the only time my husband can be there. My gosh, his teeth must be terrible. He hasn't had them cleaned in 30 years. Oh, he makes time for the dentist. Well, he's going to have to make time for the interior designer as well. So Monday to Friday, 9 to 5.30. Does it look professional when you go to somebody's house on Saturday afternoon at 4? Think about it. Does it even look professional? Ever gone to somebody's house on Sunday night at 8 p.m.? Everybody's in such a fine mood. <laughs> such a fine time to ask for money. Right? Anybody ever had that horrifying experience that they just got the kids down? You can tell they've been in a big fight all day. And I just... I just need a little bit more money from you. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Please. 15 steps. We have 15 steps. It's very simple. Everybody in my office follows the bouncing ball. The secret to keeping staff is, is steps, is systems, procedures. I started out with nothing in my operations manual. I now have an operations manual this thick. It took me many years to get to it. It has everything in there from how we answer the phone uh, to how we invoice clients, to how we collect that money. And what's amazing, when you do have a staff member leave, when you do, let's say you hire a junior designer and a couple years later she leaves, if you have those systems written down, the next one comes in and they can start and they hit the ground running and it continues to run like a very smooth machine. It's, it's absolutely the only way you can survive and thrive in this business is to get systems in place so you can succeed for sure. Um, I went backwards, not forwards. Uh, and then stick with the winners. I know that sounds annoying, but you all know that some of us are charging a decent hourly rate. We're billing for our hours. We're making money on the goods we sell. We are up to date on our insurance and our workman's compensation, and we're running a professional business. Stick to those people for your advice and your support team. What I used to do is I had a lot of designer friends and we'd go out for drinks and we'd say, oh my God, I have this client and she's such a bitch and she's driving me crazy. And then we'd all tell stories and we'd have another drink. And I mean, it was really fun. It was not productive. And this is what I now know. The clients pay my bills. The clients give me their hard-earned money and their trust. And they not only pay for my life, they pay for Kathy's life and for Victoria's life and for Isoon's life and Randy. They, they help us all buy a home, 
buy a car, have a baby. I, I went from thinking the client was the biggest jerk in the world, give me some money, <laughs> to thinking I love my clients and I love my clients and I've become very good friends with some of my clients after the project is over. <laughs> Don't become friends when they're in the middle of the project do a great job, make them happy, make them thrilled, and then if you genuinely like them, I'm not friends with the ones we genuinely didn't connect, but if you genuinely like them, take them out for lunch, take them to a movie, to buy theater tickets. I've been to Las Vegas with one of my clients because she's awesome. Um, and when we do another project together, it, it, I put on my work hat, and it's different. Uh, and the lines are very clear. Um, so surround yourself with people who give you the advice you need and to do the things you know you need to do for sure. Um, and then follow the rules. The biggest problem I've had since I've developed the 15 steps is following the rules. There's always a reason why I break a rule. Oh, well, it's a friend of a friend, and instead of having I soon phone them about the consultation, I picked up the phone and ended up in a one and a half hour conversation, three emails that did not result in selling a consultation, and now I feel a little bit taken advantage of. If I would only have passed her directly to Isoon, Isoon would have sold her a consultation, I probably would have gotten a job out of it. Every time I break the rules, I'm sorry. Every time, 100% of the time. How I calculate the retainer uh, is very detailed um, and very specific, the amount of the retainer that I ask for. And um, if I decide to take a smaller retainer, because they seem really nice, and they want to spend a lot, I always regret it. I'm always sorry. It always it bites me in the ass. So I need people around me constantly reminding me to follow the rules because I'm just naturally kind of a bend into a pretzel type person. I want to make people happy. I'm a pleaser. So I have a lot of people in my life who aren't people pleasers. Um, Kathy, who works for us, she's not a people pleaser. I'll say, I was thinking I might just charge her 5000 for the retainer. Kathy would be like, Smack, snap out of it. <laughs> the hell is wrong with you? We don't do $5,000 retainers. You know we don't. Like, right, that's right, that's right. So <laughs> I, it's like, I think of it like AA, you know, when you're in AA, which thank God I'm not. <laughs> but when you're in AA, you don't go to AA and you're fixed. You go every week or twice a week or three times a week because you, you need those constant reminders to stay on the path. I'm so blessed because I work with a community of peers through businessofdesign.com who keep me on the path, and I know if I'm giving them advice and I'm not doing it, mm, it doesn't work for me. I have to be authentic. I have to be real. I have to be honest. I'm not a poser. I don't like posing. Um, you may have noticed that. And then you have to learn to say no. I know you're afraid to put your fees on your website. I know you're even afraid to tell your clients what your fees are. The fact of the matter is a client who is unwilling to pay you $500 for two hours of your expertise Two hours of your expertise, not your time, two hours of your expertise, $500, will never give you $200,000 to do their kitchen, dining room, and living room. Never. Not going to happen. You're wasting your time. So get someone else to answer your phone who's going to be very comfortable saying no. No, that's not happening. Not happening. I can't. I can't. I can't do all the things I want to do and survive and thrive. Um, it's not realistic, but I'm a people pleaser. So I get myself into the craziest situations because I can't say no. You do need to learn to say no with clients, though. And the very moment you negotiate any of your systems or procedures with a client, you're done. The project's over, pack it in, go home. If you don't start the project off strong on the right foot, here's my consultation fee. And then at the consultation, this I want to leave you this too. At the consultation, I read my contract line by line. I ask them to sign it and give me a retainer on the spot. Line by line. I don't do what most of you do, I'm sure, because it's what I used to do, which is I'm going to leave you a contract, and if you guys want to work with me, that would be great, and you know, blah, 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 and get the hell out of there. I sit down at the table. I say, would you like to know how we work? Yes, I would. And I show them the first page of my contract, which is my mission statement and the 15 steps, and I read that first page to them, and they are mine. Mine. I, I got them. They're mine. Because they say almost 100% of the time, it, it never fails. Oh, my God. Uh, it's amazing. It's so organized. Because I've worked with other designers and it wasn't like that. Thank you. 
So the first page of my contract is my 15 steps, and then everything else in my contract is written uh, for a third grader. Anybody can understand what's written in my contract. It's very plain. They don't have to consult a lawyer to decide if they want to sign it. Very clear. Here's how we're going to work. Here's what I charge. Here's how you're going to be billed. Here's what happens if you don't pay your bill. And then we do exactly what it says in the contract without fail every single time. And my projects go from the beginning all the way to step 15 instead of all the way to step 7 and Canadian fired. I was always Canadian fired around step 7. Canadian fired. Canadian fired. Um, if you want to not get Canadian fired, say no to the wrong ones. I do have some books for sale. Um, the books are $100 each. Oh, my God, $100 each. And I will tell you this. There's $150,000 worth of coaching in here, which I'm very proud of. 100% of people who bought the book have been very happy with the book. Um, and I have, we have thousands of members on businessofdesign.com who I go and you know, tour the whole country and meet with them and talk about the 15 steps. There's nothing held back. There's no theory. This is exactly how I run my business. Every single form, all of it is in book number one and number two. Book number one is what I charge, how I bill, uh, uh, and also in book number one is the contract I use with my trades. My trades sign a contract with me. Very important. All my trades, my plumber, electrician, they all have signed a contract with me. The exact contract is in book number one. And then book number two is the 15 steps, exactly how I do it. We are doing um, some workshops this year, but they're all in the U.S. for a change. Usually they're all in Canada, but this year we're doing a lot of U.S. Uh, it's a three-day <laughs> seminar, and I teach you how to do the 15 steps. Uh, m you know, most people already have the book at that point, and they just want more, more, more. So we, we deep dive. And it is going to be in New York, Dallas, Chicago, and Los Angeles. We'd love to have you join us. I do do some private mentoring if you want me for your business partner for one year. Uh, I won't take part of your profits, but there is a fee for monthly coaching. It includes a couple of coaching calls. You will have assignments. I will dig into your profit and loss statement. I will make you more money. If you don't make more money with me, I, we won't work together because I want 100% of the people I coach to go out in the world and say, she made me double income this year. Um, I will tell you exactly how I calculate a flat fee. I will not tell you theory. I will not uh, tell you that communication is really important. I will tell you exactly what I say. Um, you'll get our exact procedures. Uh, businessofdesign.com got launched about three years ago. It's an online learning platform, and it got launched because I just couldn't keep up with the amount of people who wanted me to come out and speak uh, across the country. And then as soon as we went online, it, it, the U.S. started jumping on. So we had people at the conference yesterday from Indiana and Texas and New York, and that was awesome. Uh, and it's really fun. So online, hundreds of courses that you can watch at home, sitting in your most comfortable chair. Again, uh, there's no theory on the site. I really don't like theory. So it's prescriptive. This is what you should do. This is what I do. In addition to that, it's $59.95 a month. Okay, if you're a member of Business of Design, $59.95 for the month. You can watch 100 courses if you have time. I am also uh, available for questions on the forum. And the forum is private to only Business of Design members. It is non-searchable on Google. So it's private. You can ask me. I'm in the middle of a project. Here's what happened. What should I do? Am I, me, only me, nobody else, me, I will answer you, but everybody will be able to see it. Um, we'd love to have you be a member of businessofdesign.com. People are really uh, loving it. Um, and we certainly love to sell you a book. We appreciate when you buy a book because it allows us to do our programming uh, and keep Business of Design running. Business of Design is not my profit stream. This is not where I make money. Where I make money is with my interior design clients. But I would like to keep Business of Design running, so we appreciate your support. And um, how many of you want to be published? Awesome. Ottawa Home Magazine just walked in. Hi, Mary Taggart. How are you? <laughs> Any quick tips for how you get published? Uh, don't reach out on social media to me. <laughs> and, uh, then it doesn't, uh, it's not very exclusive, and I know you're looking anywhere and everywhere. Get to know your publication. So if it's Ottawa at Home, uh, we're local, but we can spin it if you've got a local angle for sure. Uh, any other national magazine, just be discreet is, is really, you know, I, and be persistent. If you have a great Bridget, know your publication. It's really important. That's kind of the most yeah. important. And discretion, even in this crazy social media world, discretion is still very valued. 
Yeah, I was shocked when I worked so long at Style at Home magazine. We would always get these submissions of before and afters. Style at Home doesn't do before and afters. At least it didn't for 18 years. Um, and I, I think you don't even know what the magazine is. You haven't even looked at the magazine. So, no. Yeah, right? Exactly. So, know what the magazine does. And we used to also get people send us images of stuff that was shot at night. We don't do night shoots. Architectural Digest did night shoots. They were the only one that ever did night shoots. So it just goes in the garbage. And this is the other thing uh, I would say. Unless you get a rejection letter, you haven't been rejected. You may have been overlooked. So just send it again and send it again. Eventually, they get sick of you sending it, and they don't want it. They'll send you a rejection letter. But I had that experience. We had a project in House and Home this year. I didn't hear from them four times. And I started shaming them on social media. Suzanne Dimma, why won't you look at my project? And then she would send me a private message. What project? I said, I sent it to you three times. Like, you know, so be creative, be, be, you know, respectful, obviously, but unless you get a rejection letter, no, no doesn't, you know, silence doesn't mean no, is what I'm saying. Um, how many people are going to raise your rate this year? How many people are going to raise it by $25? How many people buy $50? Who's going to raise it by $75? <laughs> Who's going to raise it by $100? I love it, you guys, you go for it. Thank you very much. We loved having you here.